She's been called a chatty teenager, a good listener, even a sympathetic friend. Can more than 20 million users in China be wrong? Well, that depends on whether it matters that she is a chatbot, an interactive computer program that learns about humans from mining the Internet. Joining us now to consider the North American future for such computer BFFs. That's best friends forever. In San Francisco, California, senior writer for the New York Times and author of Machines of Loving Grace, The Quest for Common Ground Between Humans and Robots. In Montreal, Quebec, Kim Sawchuk, professor of communication studies at Concordia University. And here with me in studio, tech expert Jesse Hirsch, co-founder of the Academy of the Impossible. Love the title of that company, Jesse. Good to have you back in the studio. And to John and Kim and Points Beyond, we're happy to have you on TVO tonight. I want to start our discussion by playing a clip from a movie that I'm sure everybody saw uh, a couple of years ago, got a lot of attention, a really unique look at something that we're in fact going to be talking about over the next half hour. Roll the clip, please. I want to learn everything about everything. I love the way you look at the world. How long before you're ready to date? What do you mean? I saw in your emails that you'd gone through a breakup. Well, you're kind of nosy. So what was it like being married? There's something that feels so good about sharing your life with somebody. How do you share your life with somebody? How are you? I guess I've just been having fun. You really deserve that. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been with somebody that I felt totally at ease with. What's it like to be alive in that room right now? I wish I could put my arms around you. I wish I could touch you. That's Scarlett Johansson's voice playing her, the title character in that movie of the same name. Jesse, I want to pick up on a line that was in there. She says, this um, best friend forever, computerized, uh, when he says, you're awfully nosy, going into my emails, she says, you'll get used to it. Are we just going to get used to this eventually someday? If it's, un if it's rolled out correctly, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the devil's in the details, and I think we're in a great marketing experiment in which the technology has incredible capabilities, but there's a huge creepy factor. And in the world of AI and robotics, there's a concept called the uncanny valley. And it's this idea that when a robot gets really close to being a human, it really throws us off. We get this sense of creepiness, and I think the same can be applied to virtual assistants. That when it's at a basic level, we're kind of okay with it. Yep. But when it becomes our Jungian psychotherapist and knows everything <laughs> about us and then seduces us... That's a bit creepy. That gets a little over the edge. So the question is, how do you gradually introduce this technology to society so that we love it rather than fear it? And I think that's where there's a number of interesting experiments that are really trying to prove that. That is happening right now. And John, just before I bring you into the conversation here, I want to read uh, an excerpt from Wikipedia here which describes something called Shaois. That's spelled X-I-A-O-I-C-E. An advanced natural language chatbot developed by Microsoft. It is primarily targeted at the Chinese community on the microblogging service Weibo. The conversation is text-based. The system learns about the user and provides natural language conversation. Microsoft gave Xiaois a compelling personality and sense of, quote, intelligence by systematically mining the Chinese internet for human conversations. Okay, John, in your view, how similar is Xiao Ice to the artificial intelligence we just saw in that clip from her? Well, you know, Xiao Ice is a long way from Scarlet. Um, it's a first step, um, and what's significant about Xiao Ice, I think, in terms of uh, what you're talking about, is many of the systems we use today, um, like Siri and Cartana, uh, Microsoft's version of Siri, um, are productivity tools. You say one thing or you ask it one thing and it gets something done. Xiao Ice was designed more as an entertainment program. It was designed for an extended conversation. And there are, I, I heard last fall, as many as 10 million young Chinese that have extended conversations. Uh, at that point, they were typing um, on the keypad of their smartphone, but as many as 60 interactions in a day. They called it toilet time. Um, <laughs> many young people go into the bathroom late at night to converse with this uh, program, which now actually has added speech. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Zhao Ice is personified as a 16-year-old girl. 
Um, and so it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a step in that direction. And, you know, 25% uh, of those who have interacted with it apparently have typed I love you to it. Uh, hmm. Now, interpreting the way in which they were saying I love you, I, I don't have that kind of data. So were they, were they joking? Did they mean it? I don't know. Well, let's follow up with Kim because uh, I think we need to understand better why so many people apparently want to have a friend like Shao Ice in their life. What do you think? Well, I think there's a lot of different reasons. I think we have to remember that Xiao Ice is um, a chat bot that's on a phone. And phones are really intimate objects. We carry them around with us. We customize them already. Um, they are communication devices that we use to reach out to people that we already know. So in these kind of general terms, I think phones, the, the fact that Xiao Ice is probably being accessed on a telephone is not, um, it's not an accident. You can take uh, Xiao Ice with you, uh, the device, the chat bot, um, into all these kind of spaces, as you mentioned, the toilet, but we also see images of people um, talking in bed. So there's a kind of intimacy that's um, there because uh, Xiao Ice is accessed through the phone and it's a held, held, handheld device that people think of as already close. I think there's other specific contextual things that uh, have been hinted at by John's research and, and other people where they've talked about the context of people from China perhaps using this while they're in North America and feeling a sense of um, not wanting to be alone. There's other issues, uh, other things that I think are fascinating about the uses of this that, you know, ask us to be really good researchers, like uh, Chinese uh, uh, teenagers or uh, older adults saying, we're using this because we also want to um, have our parents think that we are also engaging perhaps in conversations with others and, and they'll get off their, our backs. So I think there's a really a lot of you know really specific reasons, a lot of contextual reasons, and I think there's also r really specific reasons around this the the telephone and the way that it's being used. Sure, Jesse. Let me do the follow up with you. Are you distressed to learn that so many people have apparently said to Xiao Ice, "I love you"? No, I think that's natural. I think the intimacy of the device is extended upon the software. That the relationship that we have with our technology now has a subject that embodies it. I think there's nothing wrong with us loving inanimate objects. Most children love stuffed animals when growing up. I think the issue is not so much that this is a problem, but it's a symptom of a larger problem, which is why aren't they finding meaning amongst human relationships? Why is it more convenient to have this kind of relationship? And that's where I think there's a lot of power in, and that's why I evoked the Jungian psychotherapist. There's a lot of power in both the intimacy, but also the confidence that you have this person, this, this software that you can have as a confidant, that you can tell your inner secrets to. So there's also a kind of seduction around privacy, that it's getting people to give up their kind of inner secrets where they may not want to tell a human. They may not want to tell someone who has judgment, but this software reserves judgment. The privacy issue is fascinating, and I want to pick up on that with John. Apparently, Xiao Ice does conform to the privacy policies of Weibo, but do we know, John, whether or not Weibo's privacy policies in China are, say, what we might expect here in North America them to be? Uh, you know, I'm not enough of an expert on the Chinese uh, privacy guidelines. I, I think that probably we have a stronger expectation of privacy online in particular than the Chinese, but I'm, I'm not certain of that. So um, I, I don't think I can give you a, okay, a, what's a good your, answer. What's your sense about how much privacy you think people are prepared to give up in order to indulge in this? Well, it's a slippery slope. I mean, uh, Jesse's point are, uh, is, is really well taken. Is as we become more intimate with these uh, these systems, um, we may treat them. I mean, we as a society, America particularly, has this tendency to anthropomorphize almost everything we interact with, and that's part of their power, part of their emotional power. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't say in in the, my piece about Zhao Ice is that efforts in the United States have had different results. This is very culturally relative. And um, similar experiences in the United States have not had the same kind of, um, a, 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 you know, sort of, I guess, a high culture outcome as uh, the Chinese. Um, some experiments I know about in America have turned into porn bots um, and, and been buried. Um, a woman by the name of Liesl Kapper, who developed an FAQ bot, created both My Perfect Girlfriend and My Perfect Boyfriend, and then she when does she discovered she had a lot of traffic to uh, My Perfect Girlfriend, she put up a paywall. 
And then she began reading the transcript and she discovered that she did in effect become a digital madam. <laughs> and she was so uncomfortable she turned it off. Wow. Uh, Kim, let me follow up with you on this. We know that the millennials and, and actually the generation, I guess, coming up below them as well, are prepared to upload to social media uh, everything from what they had for breakfast to um, their latest bowel movement. I mean, it's all online all the time, everything. Do you expect their approach to privacy as it relates to Shao Ice and these kinds of uh, chatbots would be the same? Well, I think there's a couple of issues here. One is the question of how do we understand privacy? And I think as um, the other guests have intimated, privacy is something that we think about in, term, in personal terms. What kinds of information and secrets are we willing to share with someone else? But it's also about the kinds of ways that information about who we are, what our tastes and preferences are in terms of online traffic are also being monitored and being fed back to us in a sense to seduce us into working with these uh, systems. I also think it's not a coincidence that female voices are being being used to um, uh, anthropomorphize the machines, but, we'll, um, but maybe we can talk about that later. Well, uh, in terms actually, of age, hang I think on, it's while you're there, Hang on, Kim. While you're there, that's, that's worth figuring out. I presume they're all female voices because it is men who are overwhelmingly the users of this. Is that accurate? That I don't know, but I think there's a long history of making female figures uh, personifications of both the things we love and are seduced about by technology, but also the fears that we have about that. So if you look back to movies like Metropolis, for example, Maria the Robot um, is, uh, is one of the first uh, kind of visual examples we have in our own culture for that. And we know, I guess, Jesse, that women are thought to be more empathetic, and if you're about to spill your guts to an inanimate, inanimate object, it may as well have a female voice. I guess that makes sense. Well, and I think there's also a maternal dynamic to this, that you know we're both giving birth to artificial life, but that artificial life's purpose is to nurture us. So I think there is a, a kind of emotional labor that is associated with this type of software, and we often associate emotional labor with the sort of female or, or, or the notion of a woman providing that kind of care. But I think there's a dynamic to this that we're also leaving out, which is the teacher-student. I mean, all of this software is in such early days that every user of Shao Ice, every user of Siri and Cortana is teaching it how to improve, teaching it how to get better. Hmm. And if you're teaching a guy, there's a sense of stubbornness. There's maybe a sense of resistance. But I think when, you, when there's the gender dynamics, there is a different kind of teacher-student relationship because it's not just the software that's learning. It's the user that's also learning. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an educational component to this that's often dismissed on the entertainment value but is very profound in terms of how this technology will develop. Let's play another clip at this point because, John, since your piece in the New York Times came out about Shao Ice, um, well, this is interesting here. A TV weather presenter for Dragon TV's morning news show. Well, let's just let the clip explain the rest. Roll it, please, Sheldon. Okay, so John, where is Microsoft now in terms of developing an artificial intelligence chat bot? Clearly they can speak. What's coming next? Well, I think um, Microsoft uh, may use this uh, as, I mean, the way I describe it is the future of interface. I mean, in my city in San Francisco today, um, you know, we all walk down the street looking at the palm of our hand. Mm. And that can't be the end of user interface. And so there are a lot of people who are trying to uh, develop uh, what are called augmented reality sy systems, um, basically glasses that allow you to overlay animation and, of course, speech. Um, uh, on the real world, and uh, I'm, you know, Microsoft itself is pushing this technology called Hololens. There's a company called Magic Leap. Apple's been been rumored to work in this area. It's pretty clear that we'll go somewhere beyond the interface we have now, and I don't know how, what form it'll take, but it's quite possible that avatars. Um, I, I, I didn't see the the interaction you had, but avatars may quite well be part of the way we interact with machines in the future. Any other companies involved in this as well, to your knowledge? Oh, there are lots. Um, and here in Silicon Valley, you can't turn the corner without bumping into uh, a, a uh, augmented reality or virtual reality company. Facebook, for example, is committed. There's a startup that just announced yesterday called Meta. Um, 
There's uh, a lot of stuff coming from Japan, uh, different players, and from Korea. Uh, this is seen as the next wave in interface, and it will clearly have this kind of synthesized speech and probably an avatar that is a, a you know a, a, an animated figure um, as, as part of the design. The, qu just the question is the question is when a, a lot of these technologies you see them and the uh, the important thing is 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 not to con to confuse a clear view with a short distance. This may take decades. Uh, Kim, we had uh, Sherry Turkle on the program uh, I guess a few months ago, the MIT professor who wrote a book about trying to reclaim conversation and make sure that, um, well, as John describes it, when we've all got our heads down looking at our palms walking along the street, that we don't lose the ability actually to communicate with each other. And she says, we're forgetting what it means to be intimate. Children are learning that it's safer to talk to a computer than to another human. How concerned are you about that? Well, I think we're all concerned that, um well, maybe not everybody, but I'm concerned that this could, in fact, be part of our future. However, I think that children are also learning to be sophisticated users. So Turkle's arguments are actually pretty nuanced as well. I mean, she's really not just talking about um, uh, intimacy and privacy. She's also talking about empathy. And I think part of her concern is exactly what John was describing, is that she sees too many kids uh, around a table with their parents um, being um, thumbing and having a relationship to the, the machine and the device and not the people who are in front of them, which is why she talks about conversation. So I think that there are concerns um, that I share with Sherry Turkle's perspective and point of view, but she also makes some other claims that I think are, are really interesting but slightly contentious as well. I mean, her real point is really about the lost art of conversation um, being absolutely connected to human empathy and also looking at people in the eye and being present to those in front of you mm -hmm. as being absolutely important. Jesse, you can see, though, that, that some people nowadays find it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Safer, I guess. They find mm -hmm. it safer to talk to an inanimate object than they do to their fellow human beings. What's that about? Well, we do live in a culture of outrage, where if you make a mistake online, if you say the wrong thing, you could have thousands of people yelling at you and telling why you why you're an idiot. <laughs> and so to have a compassionate ear, whether automated or not, I think appeals to people, especially my point about being free of judgment. But, you know, I think Sherry Turkle's point is uh, conversation takes practice. Social interaction takes practice. And effort. And effort. And it's messy. Whereas the, I think the potential of a chatbot, the potential of a virtual assistant is to do away with that. And we all suffer from time scarcity. So if it helps save our time, if it helps us get to where we're going, and it makes us feel good at night, and it talks to us about our problems, it's a very seductive scenario with perhaps negative consequences, but in the short term, I think uh, really quite endearing to people who are lonely or to people who see this as a way to find comfort, especially if they're traveling, especially if they're busy and working too much. Hmm. John, do you, you want to weigh in on these issues yeah. about what scares us about human conversation? Yeah, you know, there's, a, there's an element to this, um, the, the emergence of the Internet. Um, and this notion, I mean, the term cyborg is one that used to be just science fiction, and now it's, we've crossed over, and, and it's quite real. Cy, cy, a cyborg is a combination human-machine uh, creature, and you have to remember that Borg is the root of cyborg. Borg, if you're a Star Trekky, um, is an alien species. Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. And I see uh, uh, this is actually the thing I worry about most. We're surrounded by a soup of algorithms, all sort of offering a, a soft form of control. The algorithms are not transparent to us. They're giving us advice. It's very convenient to take the, the advice. And uh, it creates a situation where, like all interaction, I, I can see a world, a dark world, in which all interaction is mediated by these algorithms and we're separated from each other. Um, it, what My point is, it's a question of design. I, 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 I got this from Alan Kay, who was one of the inventors of personal computer, who, who basically said it's our decision whether these machines are going to be our partners or whether they're going to be our masters or our slaves. And that's a design question. That's up to the people hmm. who are building these systems. And that's why I'm slightly optimistic. Um, these things aren't evolving by themselves yet. He's only slightly optimistic, Jesse. You heard it. <laughs> but I think it's important to describe these as technologies of control. I mean, they seduce us because they make us feel that they'll make our lives easier. But as John mentioned, they're very subtly controlling us. They're telling us when to leave for an appointment. They're you know, asking us in Zhao Ice's 
uh, context about our feelings and how we felt. And there are very subtle ways in which we are changing our behavior based upon our interaction with Facebook, with Twitter, with Instagram, and the extent to which that these systems become smart and responsive and actually get to know us is very much a technology of control, which if it's not transparent, if we don't know why it's making these decisions, how do we know it's making it in our best interest? And I think that's where there is a, a need for regulation. I mean, you know, can you imagine an, a, an environment in which you had a federal agency that regulated chatbots? Because chatbots would have such power and potentially put young people in such harm's way that they should be audited to make sure that their algorithms don't actually manipulate people in the wrong way. I can't tell if you're being serious here. Well, that's just it. I'm being ludicrous. <laughs> but at the same time, it's totally plausible because of the power that this technology has because of how intimate our relationship mm -hmm. is with it. Can well, it's also not knowing necessarily what information we're giving over. So again, it's not always a conscious decision about the on the part of the user is that you're showing power patterns of your own behaviors and your own desires that you may not even be uh, consciously aware of yourself that are being recorded and then put in, fed into an algorithm that's being fed back into you. Mm -hmm. Kim, I do, um, I do want to just take a moment here and circle back to what we were talking about earlier as it related to gender with this, because we know that these things uh, overwhelmingly have female voices. And I wonder whether, whether you have any um, sense or data on whether or not young girls are as interested in this as apparently young boys and, and even older. Well, the marketing research people have not given me that data, so I really don't have that data. I can tell you that, you know, from what I see and observe, young girls are as interested in these um, kinds of phenomena as, bo uh, as boys. Whether they're as interested in chatbots, that I do not know. Certainly in terms of social media and the way that they, they uh, see uh, the, the smartphone as a kind of lifeline to a whole network of friends now who they want to have instant, immediate, and constant contact with. I mean, that's absolutely the case. So I'm not sure yet about what's going to unfold here, but certainly I see that um, gender is something that we want to keep an eye on, especially because we know that in certain cases there's certain forms of um, uh, I guess I, we want to be careful about things like cyberbullying, um, sexual predators online, yeah. and, the, and the misuse of um, these kinds of technologies in terms of forms of control that um, John has already mentioned and others have mentioned. Jesse? Well, and if you are going to create gendered bots, which I think is what's happening because the manufacturers, the designers are choosing sort of feminized bots. So if you were to create a realistic young male bot, would it try to get you to take your clothes off? Would it try to, you know, persuade you as to why you should go on a date with it? Like, do we create idolized versions or do we look at what people are actually doing in chat platforms and recreate that behavior? Jesse, you're freaking me out now. No, but it's the question. Like, is it idealized behavior that we're trying to create or is it realistic behavior that we're trying to create? Well, let me That's a lot of power in the designer's hands and these are very important decisions which then impact people's behavior. So let me ask the three of you. I want to ask the three of you the personal question, which is, would you have Xiao Ice loaded onto your phone? You would, Jesse. Yes, absolutely. You would, because why? Curiosity. I it's mean, Google, so Google Now, which is Google's equivalent of Cortana and Siri, is on my phone. And Google knows everything about me. It is ridiculous the types of articles it suggests, the types of things it tells me to do. So I would like a second opinion. I would like to have a second voice on my phone to argue with Google and say, well, my algorithm came to a different decision based on the same information. I'd like to have a chorus of voices okay. all arguing with each other as my own personal parliament. Uh, we'll, we'll get right on that. Okay, John, how about you? Do you want Xiao well, Ice on your phone? Well, uh, Xiao Ice only speaks Chinese right now, so I'm safe <laughs> still, but I do use Siri a lot. I drive a lot in Silicon Valley, and Siri, Siri works pretty well. Uh, we have a very limited conversation. It's worth pointing out here that, you know, uh, uh, Jesse brought up the Uncanny Valley. In terms of speech, we have not crossed the Uncanny Valley yet. It is, there's this tech, a technology, or a, yeah, it is a technology. It's called prosody. It's the ability to design emotion into synthesized speech. And, you know, while, uh, while animations have basically crossed over that uncanny valley and we see them on Hollywood screens all the time, speech has not. And um, you can tell after you interact with one of these things for a short time that it's actually, uh, it's a machine and not a human. And that's that sort of jarring sense that, that they talk about in the uncanny, uncanny valley. 
I don't think we're going to get there immediately to Scarlett Johansson. And, and just one point about her, you know, they made that entire movie with another actress who yeah. actually her first name was Scarlett, and then they swapped her out because she didn't have the right s sensibility that uh, Spike Jones was looking for, which is, uh, you know, there is a, a human element here, and he found it in Scarlett Johansson, the actress. Well, Mm. They were using Samantha Morton, I believe, who's a yes, fabulous that's right. British oh, Samantha. actress. Yes, I'm sorry, um, Samantha. The other yes. thing is that you know someone like Scarlett Johansson is an icon and a sex symbol, so that you hear the voice and you have an image. Someone like S Samantha Morton is a little less well known, so sh you know using the voice as a strategic marketing move, I'm sure, on the part of the filmmakers as well. Mm -hmm. Kim, in our last 20 seconds here, I've got to ask you: any interest in having uh, sort of an, an English equivalent of Shao Ice on your phone? Of course I would, because I'm curious as, as well. Um, I'm not always sure that uh, I would get the kind of results and answers I'd want from Shao Ice, um, but I would be really interested in seeing what, uh, what, it, what it would be like to have this on, on, on a phone. I'm not sure I would engage in flirtual reality, as I would call it, with Shao Ice <laughs> and uh, try and enter into meaningful conversation and relationship, but I always am interested in testing the limits of new, new technologies, because I think that's one way of understanding um, what's what's hype and actually what it is they do and whether they just you know whether I would also lose my interest in them after a certain uh, point in time because again sometimes these things are really popular for a certain span and then they're replaced by something else that comes along. Fascinating. That's Kim Sawchuk from Concordia University also on the program tonight John Markoff of the New York Times and the author of Machines of Loving Grace and here in studio Jesse Hirsch the Academy of the Impossible. Thanks so much everybody for being on TVO tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.